So today we're going to look at how plants are grown, but specifically the fact that to grow a seed it must first be put in the ground. Most ways of doing this involve disturbing the soil and putting the seed in while it's all light and fluffy, you know, as people do with spades and forks and allotments and gardens, and in lots of areas where more primitive forms of agriculture survive, like this Scottish foot plough that turns the earth over as you push it in with your foot. But a very long time ago we harnessed the power of animals, first oxen and then horses, to pull our ploughs along for us. Early examples typically just scratched the soil, but certainly by high medieval times the mouldboard plough was widespread which turned the soil over. Ploughs seem a little boring in the 21st century, but I think in many ways they are the trademark of humanity, or at least of civilization. The importance of the plough in keeping us alive is seen in traditional celebrations like Plough Monday, which was obviously before people had the internet. Ploughing used to be a very skilled job because you had to go in a dead straight line. Because you could only turn the soil over one way, you'd have to set the field out in strips that were perfectly straight and perfectly parallel so they'd meet in the middle and wouldn't leave a triangle in the middle of your field that you'd missed. Medieval strip farming is often said to have created these ridge and furrow fields by throwing the soil inwards on each strip every every time they were ploughed, which leaves this wiggly field surface. Because of the skill involved in ploughing, people have ploughing matches, perhaps you could call it a sport, in which each contestant is given a strip of land and the best work wins. My grandfather and his dad won lots of prizes doing this. Until after the Second World War, there wasn't a huge amount of change in how crops were produced. Fields would be ploughed with horses or tractors, and then grain saved from the previous harvest would be cast over the fields by hand. The grain would then be sitting exposed on the uneven ground left by the plough. So the fields would be harrowed, which is to drag a series of chains or a metal frame over the soil to smooth out the work left by the plough and ensure that the seeds have a cover of soil. This is obviously quite crude, you often see harrows with a log or something on them to give them some weight. For much of history, that was it. But after the Second World War, the scientists gave us lots more machines to play with. But before we get to those, I thought I'd show you everything that we did to turn a field around in the autumn. So we returned to the 21 acre, which in the sprays episode we glyphosated to kill off the previous crop of grass. We've got some muck to spread on the field to give all the worms a tasty treat. Our muck spreader sadly passed away, so a contractor has lent us one, which is a little big for our tractor, but it does do the job. So we fill the machine up with the muck, which is very well rotted by now, and then the muck spreader has a sort of conveyor belt inside, which pulls the contents towards this vertical door at the rear, and then it has two spinning rotors on the back, which flick it out across the field. So you see the door opens and then it all starts coming out the back. We didn't have very much muck to spread so it was only about five loads perhaps. And it sure as hell beats doing it by hand. But with farming you very much get out what you put in. So we also put some digestate on the field with this absolutely massive machine. So you see here, the spreader sucks digestate out of the tanker which has carted it to the field and then heads off to spread it as the tanker goes to get another load. Digestate is the waste product from an anaerobic digester that produces fuel from organic matter, so like the muck, this is an organic fertiliser. You'll notice this is applied with a dribble bar rather than spread. This allows precision application, but also prevents too much contact with air. It's not in our interest that any of the digestate is lost to the atmosphere, so we want as much of it in the soil as possible. With all that done, the next thing to do was get ready for ploughing. First we have to attach the plough to a tractor, which is done through a three-point linkage. There's two lift arms on the back of a tractor which hook onto the machine, and then a third connecting rod called a top link is added. This allows tractors to pick implements off the ground, which is something that horses and early tractors couldn't do. Then the hydraulic pipes are fitted and the plough can be taken away for maintenance. The first thing that must be done with pretty much any machine is greasing all the moving parts so they don't wear as the machine gets used. The next thing is to check that the parts of the plough that have contact with the soil are not too worn out, because if they are it can expose the frame of the plough and we don't want that to get worn. You can see this has been exposed in the past and there is some damage to the frame, but I think this time round it's okay. Then we attach a front weight to the tractor which pulls the front wheels down and gives you more traction when you're in four wheel drive, which is necessary for heavy jobs. And then you can just get on with ploughing, which is in principle exactly the same as it has always been, but with one key difference to the machine. You will notice that there is a second set of blades in the air as we're going along here, and that's because this plough is a reversible plough. This means that instead of setting strips out and making sure they're dead straight, when you get to the end of the run you can turn the plough over. So this takes all of the skill out of the job. All you have to be able to do is perform a three point turn and then you plop your front wheel in the furrow that you came down and drive back across the field. 
You don't even have to plough straight anymore because with this system you can have a nice sweeping curve across the whole field and beyond being slightly embarrassing it doesn't matter at all. Now I did say in the sprays episode that glyphosate isn't necessary if you're ploughing but we decided to use it here because if the roots of the grass were still alive it would likely sprout again and then we'd have to work the field a second or even third time. So in using glyphosate we've saved ourselves labour but also fuel and therefore carbon emissions. Ploughing turns up lots of worms and seagulls and rooks have learnt this so if you ever see somebody ploughing the field will be absolutely full of birds. We would prefer it if the worms didn't get eaten but it's interesting how the natural world has learnt to capitalise on the annual rhythms of the agricultural cycle. Ploughing the whole 21 acres took me about two days but after that we were ready to put the seeds in. Machines for planting crops are called drills. Initially these delivered seeds into the ground through a metering system powered by the wheels of the machine so you could calibrate them to drop however many seeds you wanted per certain distance. The chap walking behind is making sure mud hasn't blocked the drill but very soon they had platforms for people to stand on. These machines are essentially the same as the ones that we still use today. This is our combi drill, so called because it combines the work of the drill, here the blue machine, with a second implement called a power harrow. Power harrows serve a similar function to the unpowered harrows that you saw earlier. They smooth out the ground by smashing it up and then rolling it flat, which leaves a nice even seed bed which is easy to drill into. So before we start drilling we have to fill the drill with seed but drills this small and this old are designed to be filled with sacks and not the massive bags that seed comes in nowadays. Because of this the drill only holds half a bag which makes filling it a bit of a pain but after this I figured out you could empty the whole bag into a telehandler bucket and then just tip the right amount in which was much easier. The seed is red because it's been treated to keep it clean and help fight off any pests that might attack it before the plant is established. This drill works in the same way as the old ones I showed you. The metering system is powered by this wheel in contact with the ground which powers this shaft which pushes seed from the hopper and into the pipes where they're delivered to the ground. With drilling it's very important that you don't miss bits so drills have markers on them to create a groove for you to follow along the next run. This is quite a crude technology but it does work in making sure that each run is parallel even around corners and that they're the correct distance apart. Tractors have lots of features to help with this kind of work like independent braking on the left and right hand sides. This allows skid steer and really tight turning circles that lets you perform pirouettes. This is quite useful because sometimes with a really heavy implement you have to make a turn without your front wheels on the ground like I'm doing here. I mean just pulling forward from stationary you can see how bad it can be. So after it's been drilled the soil is quite even. The power harrow has smashed up any big clods and rolled it flat and then the drill has delivered a seed every couple of inches. But the soil is quite loose and soft which presents two problems. Firstly it's quite easy for slugs to move across it and they'll attack the young plants and damage the crop. And secondly when the seeds germinate they might not have good contact with the soil and its nutrients. To fix this the soil is rolled which just presses it down and tucks the seeds in. Embarrassingly our roll looks even more antiquated than the vintage example having the name of the foundry that made it on the side. But most farms have bigger sets of rolls that unfold hydraulically. Cambridge rolls made out of rings like these have several benefits over flat rolls. Because each ring moves independently wet earth won't stick to them quite as well so they stay cleaner. But they also break up lumps of soil whereas a flat roll would just push it into the ground and they leave a contoured finish which allows a little bit of aeration and doesn't seal the seeds in so they can get out. When rolling it helps if you pick up any exposed stones off the ground because if your combine eats one it can be very upsetting. It seems no matter how many times you clear a field of rocks there will always be more. So this is, if you like, the traditional method of cultivation, a plough and a combi drill. And it does have lots of advantages. It's resilient, using quite a crude technology, but a technology that works. It presents a nice uniform seed bed, aerating the soil and negating any compaction that the plants might struggle against. It is organic, which in my view is neither here nor there, but it does burn a lot of fossil fuels. And because of that, you could make quite a strong case that the plough's time is up, and after all these centuries, humanity should start thinking about abandoning it. Most of the work in this process is in the turning over of the soil and smoothing it out before the seed even goes in. And there's a different way of drilling that skips that entirely. This is the no-till method, which as it says on the tin, strips pretty much all of the cultivation out of the process of drilling. Fields have tram lines in to allow for spraying and fertiliser application without driving over the crop. 
If you're careful to restrict your driving to these tram lines, they become incredibly compact, but the rest of the soil might remain in a condition that can grow a crop without any cultivation at all. This machine rips out the tram lines by lifting the soil up, but in doing so is replacing all of the work done by the plough and the power harrow. It's so much faster. All you have to do is zip round the tram lines and then you're on to the next field. And with that complete, you're ready to start drilling. So this drill can take an entire seed bag in one go, which makes it much easier to use than my one. This particular example carries the seed on the front, which I presume is to avoid the need for an additional front weight. Any additional weight would make the whole machine heavier and therefore be worse for soil compaction. The seed is metered electronically and blown by a fan down the pipe along the side of the tractor. But the drill itself is really simple. It consists of a series of tines that simply slice through the ground while the seed is dropped behind them. And that is the entire process of drilling. This is so much faster than using our combi drill. It is a bigger setup, so perhaps we should discount the fact that it's wider. But it's really fast and negates all of the preparatory work before the seed goes in. This is fantastic. It saves time, labour and fossil fuel emissions. Because the soil isn't turned over, it's not exposed to air, so it doesn't oxidise and often will store more carbon. It does rely on glyphosate to spray off any weeds or remnants of the previous crop, but as I discussed in the sprays episode, I think that's fine. No-till has other advantages in weed control in that you never plough old seeds back up to the surface, so once the topsoil is clean, you won't get so many weeds after a few years. There are tangible disadvantages, however, in the form of a reduced yield, which is because of soil compaction being a problem and a lack of aeration as the soil isn't being turned over and exposed to air. In a no-till system, soil is able to behave much like it would naturally. Organic matter is kept near the surface where the plants can get to it, and worms will come up to digest it much as they would with fallen sticks or leaves. This is very different from ploughing, which inverts the soil. There's nothing in nature that does that. But as with all things, there are complications. If there's too much organic matter in a field, it can create a blanket like this, which would prevent young plants from getting any sunlight. It is true that even ploughed organic matter might not rot on heavy ground, like this stubble from the previous year that I ploughed back up to the surface. But on the whole, this is only a problem for no-till systems. So to fix this, you could spray diluted molasses onto the soil, because the sugar content will increase biological activity and encourage it to rot down. Or alternatively, you could cultivate just a little top bit of soil with a set of discs, say. I don't have have any modern footage of disking so you'll have to settle for a vintage example. So this would mix the organic matter into the soil just enough to stop it being a problem. But as soon as you're spending time cultivating you're eating into the benefits of a no-till system. So what I wanted to do at this point was introduce a third type of drilling which solves many of the problems inherent in traditional ploughing and no-till production. There's now really big fancy drills that are single pass. You see in front of the tractor the ground hasn't previously been worked. But the drill itself works the soil with discs or tines or both and in doing so prepares the soil a little bit as it drills. So what I wanted to do was compare the efficiency of our drilling of the 21 acre to the rest of the farm on which we were going to have a contract to use one of these machines. I was going to cost them both up and presumably conclude that the bigger machine was faster, ultimately cheaper and better for the environment than our traditional kit. And then the punchline would have been that this kit is just not available for small family farmers like us. I just don't think there are direct drills that our little blue tractor could handle. So there are lots of advantages to a move to this type of production, but at the same time it's just pushing out the small farmer completely, which from a cultural angle I think is a shame. However, as is often the case, Mother Nature had different ideas, and once we'd rolled the 21 acre, it started raining and pretty well didn't stop for the entire autumn. A lot of people struggled with flooding, which we were fortunate enough to avoid, but it meant that our fields turned into a soup that you couldn't drive on. This was very stressful, because our income relied on these six fields that we had outstanding to drill, but at the same time, it just couldn't be done. The contractor decided that it was so wet that he just put his big fancy drill in the shed, so last year it wouldn't have seen much use at all. So one of the benefits of the traditional method is that it is resilient. If you plough at wet ground, I found that it is dry enough to drive on so long as it doesn't rain before you drill it. So I was able to do a little bit with my tractor, which is small, so has the benefit of not weighing as much and therefore sinking less than the bigger machines. But there is only one of me, so I tried to get some economies of scale by ploughing two fields in one go before putting the drill on, but then I only managed to drill the first field before it rained and the second one became absolutely impassable, which was a nightmare. So in the end, the contractors came anyway, but with equipment suitable for the wet weather. The tracks on this machine spread its weight and allowed it to drill the soup just about. But you see where he's driven, it was unbelievably wet. But even though this is a massive machine with tracks and a satellite steering system and a ridiculous turning circle, the drill he's using is just a combi drill. It's using the same technology as the first one I showed you that was being pulled by horses. Even with all this electronics, the metering system was being driven by a wheel in contact with the ground. 
and the rest of the fields were ploughed. Their ploughs are much bigger than ours. This one's blades are for heavy ground because the fingers will vibrate independently and stop mud sticking to them. It really was so wet. They were struggling a bit. But in the end, we finished drilling in the middle of November, which is about the latest you'd want to put the wheat in. The hold up from the wet weather was actually a blessing in disguise because we'd saved the wheat sitting in wet ground for a month and a half. This is what the 21 acre looks like now. It's come up quite well, I think, although there are some patches of water damage. But, you know, there's not always much you can do about it. So what is the moral of this story? There is quite a lot here. Perhaps it is that you can have the fanciest machine in the world, but if Mother Nature doesn't play ball, there's not much you can do about it. And as climate change progresses, this will get worse, which is very scary. But as the people who celebrated Plough Monday knew, these processes are absolutely essential to keeping us alive. Even though most people are now removed from them, if they fail, it will be catastrophic. Anyway. I hope that gave you an impression of the various answers to the various questions surrounding cultivation. These examples are all anecdotal. For every farmer there is a different way of doing things. Uh, this is just what I managed to stick my camera in front of. But I hope you enjoyed it. Stop by next week when the natural world continues to bite back.